Hello. Good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Whatever time of the day it is for you. Why am I making this video? Why are you here? Now, you've already read the title and you have certain expectations. No sweat. We will deliver on those expectations. Now, I've been working in the design and creative space for the last two decades. And this is something that I see cut across every kind of client that I have worked with from a business focused on selling to businesses to businesses focused on selling to consumers from selling very complicated technical finance solutions and implementations that last five to six years to selling a toothpaste or an ice cream. Now, this is a problem that exists, especially with experts in finance, technology, business, whatever that expert is, engineers, or even creative people. Because what happens is that people who are really good at what they do really suck at the selling part. By the way, if you are enjoying this content, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. The larger sentiment that I've seen across the board selling as, ew, I don't do this. Now, they all have their own version of, ew. And it's also because we've been, throughout our lives, we've been inundated with like really shitty versions of selling. People sending us unwanted, unsolicited marketing crap. So over time, we developed this very negative idea around sales. For the last few weeks, I was thinking about writing an article or making a video on how to actually look at sales. And that sales is not about selling to businesses. It's not about selling to technology. It's actually about having a conversation where you're serving and helping other human beings. As I was doing some initial desk research to kind of craft a story around this, I actually stumbled upon a really interesting gem. At first, I was super excited when I saw this book because it had basically articulated what I had been feeling and thinking for the last two decades, but also felt a little sad because I was not the author of this book. But you know what? That's the thing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there's a great piece of content or thinking, somebody's actually already gone down that path and figured it out, you can either build on it, share it, and uh, learn from it. So what are we going to do in today's episode? In today's episode, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this book page by page, and I'm going to share my thoughts and experiences overlaid on top of what this person has put together in this book. So having said that, let's jump right into it. The title of the book goes, There is no B2B and B2C. Human to human. Hashtag H2H. Bring back the human side of communication in all its imperfection, empathy, and simplicity by Brian Kramer, edited by Courtney Smith. So what is H2H? Communication shouldn't be complicated. It should be genuine and simple with the humility and understanding that we're all multidimensional humans, every one of which has spent time in both the dark and delightful parts of life. That's human to human. Now, what you'll see is that a lot of people treat others in black and white because we take these mental shortcuts. But when we look at ourselves introspectively and self-reflect, we're like, oh no, I am 50,000 shades of gray because I can have opposing views. And when we look at somebody else, because we want to reduce the mental cognitive load on ourselves, we put people in buckets. We like to put people in very simple black and white boxes. Love it. I love the opening statement. Okay. These first three lines, I find myself saying and repeating hundreds and thousands of times in meetings and conversations all the time. Businesses do not have emotion. Products do not have emotions. Humans do. You're not selling to a business. You're not selling to a product. You're not selling to a technology. You're not selling to an Excel sheet. You're selling to a human being who's going to use that technology or that service or that thing. And humans have emotions. Love that sentiment. And then humans want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Humans want to be included. Humans want to be part of something bigger than themselves. That's why, that's why humans like to be part of something, 
part of religion, part of a community, part of an idea, just understanding the human condition, the human emotions, the difference between what people are saying, what they're feeling, what they're doing and how they're acting. You can cut right through all the crap and get to what is really important to that person at that specific point in time. So humans want to be included. Humans want to feel something and humans make mistakes. That's why there's so much communication out there that people just throw away that they're just like, no, because it didn't hit an emotional chord. You go in with like, oh, but I, but our thing does this, 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 this. And the person's like, no, because you've not penetrated to that emotional layer. Anyways. Okay. Let's keep going. (laughs) I'm clearly very passionate about this subject. As you can see. Brian, I swear I have a crush on you. Okay. Okay. Another good line here is that segmenting customers into business or consumer was unnatural and unintuitive approach to marketing. Totally agree. Remove all the crap, remove all the fluff, remove all the labels, remove the buildings, remove the titles. At the end, there's a human being who's going to use that thing, who's going to have to live with that solution, who's going to be opening up your software every day to do their pension or to document their time or the person who's going to use your toothpaste or the person who's going to eat your eat the ice cream. If we're talking, then we're talking to a human being because dogs and monkeys don't understand what we are saying. Okay. We use language to communicate to other human beings, not buildings, not the technology. Okay. Let's keep going. So now what happens is that with all this complexity of technology and systems and digital and, you know, when you start to hear all these fancy words and labels and superlatives and jargon, it's mind numbing. And because people use mental shortcuts and there's this cognitive overload, you just shut off. So how do you simplify that communication We need to bring back that human side of communication in all its imperfection, empathy, and simplicity. We're literally on the first page. So so some of the really good and salient points on this first page talk about the fact that, you know, and I'm just kind of repeating myself here, is that businesses don't have emotions. Products don't have emotions. I would even further go and say technology, finance, your software, uh, the, the actual product that you have, they don't have an emotion. But the humans using that product, living with that product, using it day to day, consuming it, have emotions. You can actually use the power of brand to build emotion around your product, your service, or that offering that you have. But at the end of the day, you're basically bridging the gap between what you have to offer and what a human being is going to use. And to communicate to a human being, you have to speak like a human. You're not speaking in features. You're speaking in outcomes, in the benefits. Next page. Chapter one, the unnatural language of business. Consumers are confused with a whopping 93% of communication based on nonverbal body language. That leaves just 7% left to explain verbally what we really mean. So why can't we make it simple for people to understand what we're selling so they can more easily share their experience and the value they felt with others? I think the part that I would first take out from this is Why is it that what we're marketing most often does not align to actual consumer experiences? Because what we tend to get into when we're marketing is selling the solution, selling the features, selling all the technical crap that nobody cares about. People care about what they care about. People relate to the world based on their experience and what they need. And people are selfish. So If somebody has a problem or a challenge and you have a product that can solve that problem, you're not going to win them over by spraying them with features. You're going to win them over emotionally first and then give them the rational, logical reason of why your product is good. I don't care what language you speak, who your brand is or what message you're trying to send. We all need to speak more human. This is just gem. Too often... We complicate what we're trying to say. Ironically, as our world becomes more customer owned and socially enabled, we continue to see complicated, redundant, over technical and overthought mass messages getting pushed out and lost in the ether. If by just giving people the facts and 
logic, you could win them over, we would be living in a very different world. <laughs> you don't win people over by facts and logic. You win people over emotionally and then bring in the facts and logic later. Just remember, you're not speaking to algorithms and and buildings. You're speaking to human beings. With so much data and information out there, the answers to clearly say what you mean in understandable human words. And I think this is a really good question. That is, why do business marketers think they need to speak differently to their audience? Now he goes on to say, I can't tell you how many meetings I've been in where the acronyms are used so often that my brain ends up spending so much time trying to decipher what they mean instead of focusing on the actual thoughts trying to be conveyed. Now, if you're a, a big business, you know, you're a software company or you solve very complex problems. Now, with your industry, with your business comes your own lingo and your own speak. And internally, how you communicate with your peers and colleagues is very different to how you would speak to your end customer because they don't understand your complicated jargon. They don't understand your acronyms. You have to speak to them like a human being. And the only way you can actually do that is firstly, is if you understand your subject really well. Have you heard that phrase? Talk to me like I'm five years old or explain it to me as if I'm five years old. Professor Feynman, who's a famous physicist, has some really great thinking around this. Now, acronyms have their place, but not when they replace communicating information to someone else who might not understand what your world full of capital letters. We also need to think like customers we are, putting ourselves in the mindset of the buyer instead of trying to speak such an intensely sophisticated language full of acronyms and big words in order to sound smarter. Anytime somebody uses fancy words, labels, acronyms, I see it as a crutch for them not having a complete and thorough understanding of their own subject, what they're trying to communicate. And in that pursuit of sounding smarter, they actually look dumb. I mean, they might look smart to a few people, but the people that really matter to them, they look pretty dumb. And by the way, what's the point of sounding really smart if you can't get the point across and you can't make that sale? So you come off as super smart but the other person's not buying. What's the point of using all that fancy crap jargon? Now, another great example I can think of is doctors. Now, some doctors that I've met across my lifespan, they will explain your injury and symptoms in such simple words, but they understand all the complex medical jargon and all the ingredients that go into a medicine, but they will explain it to you in such simple terms and language that you can understand. They're not trying to talk to you as if you are a doctor. They're trying to talk to you as a patient, as a human being who has a fever. I am so aroused by this literature. <laughs> because technology demands a way for us to communicate in a new way, is it really making us more efficient? Because of social media and the way we communicate in the modern world, I think there's a difference between impersonal and personal way of communicating with people, the way you would communicate to a friend versus how you would communicate in a professional environment. Humans understand and process information in context and understanding where your audience will consume that information. So are they going to be on TikTok? Are they going to be in a boardroom looking at a PowerPoint presentation? Are they going to be in a theater watching a movie? In social, content is important, but context is huge. Exactly. You the way you communicate on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn are very different. Sharing is an art form. The words that you tweet, post, or write are planting the seeds for the experience. When your audience takes your message and relates to it, to their life in a new way, that's when the experience blossoms. Okay, this is a really good one. Skip to the last page. How many times has this happened with you where you've made a proposal, sent it to the client, and all they do is skip to the last page where you're Pricing is ignoring all the content up front and leaving you frustrated because you're like, I put in all this work into the strategy, into the thinking, and the client is just focused on the price. Client or the buyer is very price sensitive, or you're talking to somebody in procurement, possibly. But another way to look at it is the story that you're telling them from the beginning of your proposal to the end, from bookends, 
is that an effective and compelling story that hooks them in? So you don't want to lead your audience down a path that just starts meandering aimlessly. They'll likely not to stick with you. Because right out of the gate, if you start talking features and solutions without even identifying the real emotional hook point or the real challenges and problems and demonstrating empathy, you're going to lose them and they're going to skip past to the pricing page and say you're too expensive. This is a, another really good point, which is get out of your head. So whatever you think is normal and what you're doing intuitively, when you break that down analytically, do other people also see it in that same way? You'd be actually surprised that what you've accomplished and learned over years of experience. For other people, that might be the most complex thing. A good perspective here is that look at what you're sharing from an outsider's point of view. Ask someone on your staff, a friend or colleague, does this make sense to you? You would have potentially even just lost that person with the first two words that came out of your mouth. Maybe they didn't understand the acronym. Maybe they didn't understand the technical word that you used and you lost them constantly test out what you're saying and how that's resonating with the buyer, the end customer, or the person that you're communicating to. I mean, I am no perfect queen over here uh, or king. I constantly strive and practice this by questioning, challenging, and testing out what I'm thinking with other people around me to see if it sticks, if it hits the right spot or not. So this is great. So the, what is the key takeaway? It's not just about what you share, it's about how you share it and thinking through how people will likely receive it. Content provides a message, but context creates the experience and the connection that you're trying to achieve. What you know, what you've honed in on, what you've practiced, what you've learned over decades, don't expect the person that you're talking to will have that same level of exposure, experience, and understanding. So talk to them. In simple words, leave out the acronyms, leave out the jargon, leave out the crap. Try to talk to them as if you were explaining it to a five-year-old. We're hitting chapter two. So how to speak human, tapping into our needs and senses. The first good point here is that, you know, humans consume socially. And if you kind of think about how human beings have evolved, we grew up in tribes, in small tribes, and we learned from others. Now, if you compare, for example, if you look at, you know, when a giraffe is born, the moment it is born, it knows how to walk. It knows pretty much how to feed. And the mother basically is just protecting it from it from predators and prey. Whereas for a human being, when it's born, it knows nothing. And over time, humans learn everything by observing the world around them. When you can map what you're communicating to the human senses, the deeper and more meaningful your connections will be. The moment you start thinking about human behavior, human psychology, how humans interpret and consume and learn. So if you start thinking about your message and what you have to communicate based on that principle, then you're going to hit all these emotional cords and have a very sticky story which is going to be very compelling and engaging. So, okay, so now this is actually a breakup of the human senses. So sight. For some reason, design is often overlooked in product design to its own demise. Think your IT or engineering audience doesn't care about great looking marketing. Think again, design matters. As humans, we naturally appreciate nice looking things. Oftentimes I come across engineers, technical people, finance people. They're like, oh, it just has to be an Excel sheet. You know, it, it doesn't have to look good. It doesn't have to look pretty. It's like they're, they talk in one way, but the moment they leave their desk, they leave their office, they want everything to be pretty designed. They step into the world where they demand things be designed and crafted well. So design matters. Exactly. The way a thing looks is equally important as how it works. Touch. In both senses of the word, the physical act of touching something and the emotional touching of others, feel what you're saying. If you connect with what's being said, others will too. 
think through the experience you want your users to have in the context of how they're consuming it. Make it tactile, make it a game, make it interactive. Whatever your choice is, make it meaningful for them. You'll know when it's meaningful for you. Now, how many times have you found yourself in a conversation where you're really amped up and excited about a subject and just by that sheer virtue, people around you get excited. <laughs> people get excited and engaged in that topic. Exactly the same thinking you want to apply to your product, to your solution, to your feature, to whatever that thing is, your marketing, because what you feel is going to come across. And people are not stupid. People see right through the bullshit. People know when they're being sold to. And nobody likes being sold to. Okay, listening. This is the mother of skills when it comes to successful conversations. You'd think being good at this is fundamental, but it's not. Actively listening in the context of social media means monitoring social conversations and joining in. Stop selling and be genuine about serving and helping other people. And by doing that, you're actually doing very effective and compelling sales. So let's say, for example, you know, if somebody's really aggravated, you know, they there's something wrong with a product that they didn't understand and they're venting online or on Twitter or, or social media. Typically, what you find is when something doesn't work or somebody experiences bad customer service, they go to Twitter and they vent. Now, that's a moment for you to do crisis management, get proactive and really be empathetic to that person's challenge and problem and build a customer for life or act like a robot <laughs> and completely destroy that relationship. So brands are presented with shining moment opportunities every day to create positive interactions with their customers, both happy and not. Have you ever shared your comments with another human over email and they simply never responded? Most brands I come into contact with are afraid to reply back because if they reply back to one, they think they have to reply back to everyone. Not true. There are unique conversations that do not deserve to be dismissed. When a consumer builds up the courage to tweet a brand and broadcast their unique experience as a thank you or negative feedback, the worst thing they could receive is a radio silence. Just like in real life, when people want to talk, and it falls on deaf ears, the perception is they don't care. The moment when a brand could have taken someone from a fan to raving misses the opportunity is what I call a wrecking ball to the brand. 86% of online consumer feedback is missed by brands. Think of the last time when you had a very memorable experience talking to a company or a brand. It sounded like you were talking to a human being. That's right. So would you prefer to talk to a chatbot or a real human being? Huge difference between talking to a chatbot and a real human being. And I know like a lot of companies are trying to find like efficient ways and trying to optimize and create like these FAQ pages. And that's great. But when companies make it hard to get in touch with a real human being, I think that's just shitty and a missed opportunity. Not everything is about efficiency and optimization. Because humans are not efficient and optimized. Another great benefit of actively listening gives you golden nuggets of feedback, criticism, and praise and empowers brands to perform random acts of social marketing kindness that make social media relatable to our offline lives. That's a great point. If you're actively listening to your customers on social media, through forums, whatever the platforms are. If you're listening and you're actively listening, paying attention to what your customers like, what they don't like, what they're struggling with, what their challenges are, you're putting yourself in a much better position to come back to them, number one, with a better solution, two, to have empathy and to have a better conversation with them. Now, even though I'm a designer, I spend 99% of my time investigating, searching, thinking, and pondering over human emotions, human feelings, what irks people, what makes them laugh, what makes them sad, what excites them, what compels them to do the things that they do. 
why they get angry, conflict management, <laughs> why do people get a divorce? These are the kind of subjects that excite me and which actually help me become a better designer. Now, that's a great segue into, you know, the six basic human needs as defined by Tony Robbins. OK, and he talks about connection and love. So people need to feel connected to themselves, to their families, their community, their country, their planet, their universe. And for brands, it goes without saying that if you can't connect with your audience, you need to identify the problem and approach it differently. This is why communities exist. People need to connect and feel affirmed by other like-minded people. Now, even though in the modern world, we no longer live in tribes like we used to, <laughs> we still tend to bucket ourselves and huddle together with other like-minded people. Oh, uh, you know, so, you know, if I'm a designer, I want to go hang out with other designers. You know, if you belong to a certain religion, you belong to a certain sports team, you belong to a certain company, whatever, or you belong to a certain neighborhood or you belong to a certain idea. So people like to bucket themselves and group themselves with other like-minded people. So yeah, people are looking for connection and love. In fact, I'm looking for connection and love. If you are a pretty looking girl and single and looking for a really smart guy who is bald, a little bit hairy, and very inquisitive about humans and pretty decent designer, then hit me up. Just kidding. <laughs> Okay. And significance. We all need to be acknowledged for a job well done. We need to own our own hilltop somewhere. We need to be a star of our own movie. This is why awards exist. It's a contradiction to this idea of, you know, let's give everybody participation trophies and certificates. You're taking away from all the hard work somebody puts in to come in first to be the best at that thing. Yeah, that's probably a very controversial point of view. but. Yeah. Variety and uncertainty. That's the next one. Everybody loves an adventure, a ride, the unpredictable. As humans, we need things to be different so we don't die of boredom. Certainty. We all want to know what's going to happen. We need things to be the same so there are no surprises. This is why schedules and rhythms are fundamentally important to humanity. Certain things make us feel safe and protected. This is such a paradoxical human condition where we want certainty in a few spheres of our life. But at the same time, we want variety and uncertainty. Like for example, in a simple relationship, you want variety. You want to try different things when a relationship becomes boring. That could be a relationship between a man and a woman. That could be a relationship between two businesses. That could be even with the way you communicate in your advertising. You want to spice things up. You want to do a brand refresh or a communication refresh and so on. This is such a good one. Growth. I constantly marvel at people who proclaim that they're happy with themselves exactly as they are right now. Every human being has a need to grow mentally, cerebrally, psychologically, ethically. In other words, we were built to never stop learning. Growth for everyone is different. Some are going at us at the speed of a snail and others at the speed of a rocket. And sometimes it's not even about the speed. It's about the direction in which you're growing. Contribution. This is to do with like giving back, I'm guessing. Everyone needs to feel like what they're doing is making a difference. In work, we need to feel like an important contributor to the success of the company. To be wanted, to be desired. We donate our time to help others in need in any case. We all need to feel like what we're doing matters and matters for a reason that is greater than ourselves. Are you having a tone deaf conversation or are you really listening, paying attention, have empathy and then responding accordingly? That trickles down in the way you do your proposals, in the way you do a sales call, in the way you respond to a client email, the way you handle feedback from customers online, the way you do crisis management, that trickles into every single thing that you do. Okay, 
So this is another really good point is that learning is a fundamental human trait as marketers. Part of our role is to not only help others become successful through teaching and learning, but to go through the process with eyes wide open to keep making things better in our own work. We have so many biases. We have a confirmation bias. There's just a whole list. I mean, there's a whole list of biases that we have that we'd live with. Those biases are our blind spots. And to constantly putting yourself in the cycle of your customer or your end consumer, you're looking at the problem that you're going to solve through their lens and find out, is that even a problem that they have? Or is that an assumption that you have? You're focused on what the end consumer or customer is feeling, what their actual challenge is. You can craft that messaging, that story accordingly. Another part of this is being wrong and the ability to admit that you're wrong. That's a really good point here, by the way. We're on to chapter three now. Humans just want to be heard. Customers as humans are fickle and are so empowered today that they expect extraordinary, over-the-top experiences that rock their world. Nothing less will do. Gone are the days where feedback was kept quiet and experiences were collected around a review form. Today, your customers' comments are transparent to your competitors, making it easier for them to publicly see your pain points. Comparisons are easier to make and product switching happens faster than ever. Customers are ready to move on unless they have one thing, an undying relationship with the person or people at your brand who made them feel uniquely special. By putting everything out in the open, that makes inherently everything available and accessible to everyone. So your competitors can see where your gaps are, what frustrations your customers have with your product and solution. And if they're agile and fast and they can solve that problem, they can pretty much take your customers <laughs> in a heartbeat, in a flash. That's why so many startups you know, comprising of like two people can go up against a Microsoft, can go up against like these giant organizations because they have the ability to see the gaps and move fast enough to solve that problem. A great example of this is somebody like Microsoft has infinite budget, but they're not the ones who came up with Zoom. And Zoom is not even new. Look at what they did with Skype. You might have deep pockets. You might have the best of the best experts. But if those experts and all that budget and all that money is not finely tuned and empathetic to human beings and their problems, all that resource and power is pretty much useless. This is what happens when you live in the city. There's constant police sirens. You might say that helping others comes naturally to the human race. But for most people, it doesn't. Yet on social web, it's the single most effective form of earning trust and gaining influence. <laughs> At any given moment, someone is trying to earn something from someone, whether it's trust, loyalty, respect, even love. It's the intangibles that people desire but can never buy. As humans, we want to be heard and know that someone out there is listening. So how do you scale to make everyone feel like they matter? now? Social is an interaction platform that requires the routing of conversations to the right people to get the right answers. The person asking the question doesn't care what department the social employee is in. They just want their question answered. Businesses need to work from the inside out and ask themselves, what do our customers want? A customer who has a problem with your product doesn't care internally how you solve that problem or how complex it is or what are all the intricacies involved. They just care about the problem that they're having. They don't care how complex and how tedious it is on your end. They just want their problem solved now. Now, this book does have a lot of other examples and ideas, but I want to keep it strictly focused on B2B versus B2C from a selling perspective and not from PR and communications perspective. 
although those are a lot of there's a lot of overlapping circles here. Uh, but if you're really interested in all those different ideas and and thinking, I highly recommend downloading a copy of this book and going through it with the fine tooth comb because it is really good. I will be linking this book in the description below. Just saying. Also, by the way, if you're enjoying this video, you're enjoying me reading this book and sharing my insights and thoughts, then be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Human beings are innately complex yet strive for simplicity. It's the simplicity of our favorite communicators, brands, and products that make us fall in love with them because we get what they're saying. It takes a lot of hard work to make something so complex look so easy. Some call it brilliance, but perhaps we should call it speaking human. Well, this is actually a case of the confirmation bias where I think there's no difference between B to B and B to C. And I found an example. So this, <laughs> so Brian Kramer is actually feeding into my confirmation bias. Well, here's what I would recommend. Figure it out for yourself. But I will be doing more videos like this where we dive into the trenches, look under the hood and see the difference between B2B and B2C and how they're different and how they're actually the same. We'll also talk about branding in the coming episodes because that's another area that I've spent the last almost two decades learning and working with companies on. Is there <laughs>